Hey guys, welcome back. So for this one, we're getting into Brian Hill's 2023 Blade series, which I've been enjoying quite a bit so far. So I figured we'd cover it on the channel since it also ties into some of the other stuff that we're covering, like the Philip K. Johnson Hulk series, as well as some Doctor Strange too. So let's get into it. But first, if you're new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to catch the spills every week. And don't forget to hit that bell up top to get all notifications so we can squat up in the comments for the first hour. All right, so starting this out, we begin in one of the most dangerous places in any blade form of media, and that's a nightclub. Cause it's here where we're shown a girl who's just off to the side having a drink as she begins to notice a few suspicious activities going on, like glowing red eyes staring at her and some random dude putting a chain lock on the door. So right away, the look on her face is just screaming, I'm in danger, without her saying a word. And for us, it isn't until she spills her drink on the table, where we see through the reflection of what she was drinking, this club is filled with vampires. So for her, like anybody who's in their right mind, she loses it. And she makes a break for the door that she just saw get chained up, by the way. But with how it's done, it's here where we get one of those moments where this is when she realizes that she's trapped. But out of nowhere, a car comes crashing into the club with bright UV headlights hitting some of these vampires and causing the others to combust into glowing embers, with this clearly being the over-the-top entry for Blade. But as he steps out the car, he immediately recognizes this girl, because as it turns out, he's been looking for her for some time. And we'll get back to the reason why in just a little bit. But first, as soon as Blade gets here, he just starts wrecking these vampires. And it's not even a ton of them that he has to fight, because for the most part, aside from the vampires who were killed upon entry, a ton of the other vampires knew that this was Blade, so they just took off running. But after finding this girl, Blade just tells her to get in the car, so of course she has questions. But he tells her that they can talk on the way, so right there, she's like, on the way where? And he just tells her on the way out of here. And after they leave, it's in this conversation where Blade tells her who he is and she's asking him, why is everyone after her? Which is a question that he does not have the answer to. But when she asks Blade, why is he helping her? It's here where we get the backstory of why Blade was even looking for this girl in the first place. Cause as it turns out, just a week ago, Blade got a call from Tanaka, who at the time gave him a very cryptic explanation to this girl's whole situation. Cause back at her place, her boyfriend is pinned to the wall with all sorts of swords and knives after the two of them were attacked by something. So Tanaka shows Blade a picture of the girl. He tells him that her name is Dana Smith and the bottom line is that the werewolf nation needs Blade to protect her from whatever this thing is. And the reason why Blade is even doing this is to make good on the favor he owes this guy, but that's it. So Blade asks, is she a werewolf as well? And Tanaka tells him, no, she's just important, charmed. And he goes on to tell Blade that there's been a shift in the second world which is the world of your vampires, werewolves, and specters. And if Blade were a full blood, he would have felt this shift as well. And as it stands, the elders of each nation, they're not exactly sure about what they're dealing with, but what they do know is that this girl, Dana, she's in the middle of it and she needs to stay alive. And as far as the thing that's hunting her, they don't have a name for it. He's part of cultist, might be immortal, but they're not really sure where this guy's from. So to summarize the mission, Tanaka wants Blade to find Dana first, kill whoever it is that's coming after her and call it a day. But for a moment here, Blade looks at the boyfriend who's pinned to the wall and he tells Tanaka, oh yeah, one more thing, this guy is not dead. So Blade just kills him quick and clean and he more or less tells Tanaka like, okay, let me get this straight. You're looking for an assassin who can turn dead bodies into undead weapons. He's chasing a girl, you don't know why. And if he kills her, the world ends. And Tanaka's like, yeah, that's pretty much it. So Blade's like, fine, he'll find the girl and bring her back to him. But the rest of whatever this is, it's Tanaka's problem from there. But just before Blade leaves, he lets Tanaka know that if he finds out that he's lying, he won't be able to howl fast enough. Because if that's the case, then Blade's going to have to track him down like a post credit scene. But jumping back to the present with Blade and Dana, it's here where the two of them arrive at Tanaka's house. And at this point, he's trying to get her to share some kind of details because he has no idea what he's up against. And he's putting his neck on the line with no clue of what this assassin is capable of. So Dana just tells him she was on her couch with her boyfriend. This thing showed up, it killed her boyfriend, so she ran. But the thing is, at this point, she's told him that already. And he definitely heard her the first time. But what he's trying to ask is what did the man who killed him look like? And it's right there where the assassin just comes crashing in from above, which really is one way of answering that question. 
but right away the assassin he starts speaking in a language that Blade does not recognize. But at the same time with this dude drawing a sword, that part sends a clear message. So Blade tells Dana to get behind him and him and the assassin go toe to toe for a while. And it even gets to the point to where this assassin nearly kills Dana. But before he does, Blade's able to handle it, save Dana and take this guy out. But as soon as Blade kills the assassin, he finds out that something was hiding inside of this girl the whole time. Cause come to find out, this is the primordial demon, Adana. And Blade just killed what was the only person who could destroy it. But more specifically, this sword is the only thing that can destroy the Adana. And the assassin who had came here just to do that, drained his whole life learning how to use this weapon. And now he's gone. So in a single quick motion, Blade just takes her head off, only for her to catch it before it even hits the ground. And it almost seems like he was just calling her bluff real quick, cause she already told him the sword that she's holding is the only thing that can kill her. <laughs> so Blade tried it, he tested it, and it didn't work. So she goes on to tell him, while holding her head in her hand, moments before she puts it back on, that she's come to destroy the first and second worlds to form a new one. And Tanaka served her well, cause he told her all he had to do was point Blade at something he could hate, and from there Blade would just do what he does. But after saying this, the Adana goes on to express how she's intrigued with Blade, and because she likes him, she'll allow him to live long enough to see how all this ends. And you can tell that it's mainly based on the idea that Blade's the Daywalker. He's the half man, half vampire hybrid, who the Adana doesn't want to kill just yet, but instead just really observe and see how he handles certain conditions throughout the course of this. And we immediately see this in play, cause she tells Blade, I'd like to hear you scream. So she sends the broken glass that's laying on the ground flying directly into him, and it gets him to scream, or at least what passes for a scream as far as Blade goes. And right there, the Adana tells him, I like the way you scream, Eric. You'll heal. You always do. Find me if you want. I'd like to hear that scream again. Which right there is just your subtle demonstration that lets us know that the Adana could kill him. But for other reasons, she'd much prefer that he endures and goes after her so that she can observe Blade for what he is until the presumable end. And after she leaves, she takes the sword with her and she uses it to split herself open and peel the skin off of her body as she converts into what is her more common form. And over time, throughout the course of this series, we'll learn more about the Adana and how it is exactly that she plans to destroy the first and second world. But before that, from here we jump forward 13 days where we head down to Cambodia and we're shown Ratha, the younger sister of the assassin we saw Blade kill a couple weeks ago. And it's here we find out that their group, the Swordsman Sect, they've eventually caught up with Blade and they've more or less sentenced him to death for killing one of their own and dooming the world. But right now Ratha is asking for the other members to allow her to carry out Blade's judgment. But these guys are like, nah, we about to take our time as they go on to try and serve him a slow death. But out of nowhere, Ratha just slaughters the other members of her group. And she goes on to tell Blade that they only have minutes before more of these guys show up. And when they do, she won't be able to take them all. So she tells him before she cuts him down, she needs him to promise that he's gonna help her stop the Adana from ending all creation. But as soon as she tells him this, Blade is just quiet for a moment. <laughs> so then she's kind of like, um, okay, will you? Like say something and Blade's like, I'm thinking about it as if he's just got all kind of options in this moment. But eventually he's like, why not? Let's save the world. So she cuts him down and the two of them get out of there. But going forward, Ratha is now a rogue member of the Swordsman sect. And going forward, these guys are going to be looking for them. In addition to Blade trying to stop the Adana. All right, so coming back, we find ourselves in Japan with an occult arms dealer by the name of Tulip who's gotten herself into a bit of a predicament with what turns out to be an unhappy client who's getting ready to take her out because they didn't like her return policy or better yet, lack thereof. But just when Tulip believes that this guy's getting ready to squeeze the trigger, she hears a gunshot only to turn around and see that Blade has killed the disgruntled client before he could kill her. And from here, the two of them go back to her condo so Tulip can wash up and get all the blood and skull fragments out of her hair. And at this time, we find that Blade has filled her in with his whole situation as far as releasing a primordial demon called the Adana and going on to kill the only person who was prepared to kill it. But Tulip just lets him know that she's already aware of this to an extent because she's clairvoyant and she's been having dreams recently. But it hasn't been until now where she's been able to identify what her recent dreams were about and tie it all back to Blade. 
But aside from him coming here to get help from Tulip, who's one of the best occult weapons dealers that he knows, to find another weapon that can kill the Adana, we also learn that the two of them have quite a bit of history. So in addition to them catching up, they also do a bit of getting down. But even still, Blade makes sure to let Tulip know that he's serious about needing her help. And for her, she sees this as a business transaction. So if she decides that she even wants to help him, he's going to owe her in return. And also with Blade telling her about the kid who rescued him from the mountain cult like we saw in the last issue, she asks Blade, where's that kid now? So he just tells her that she's tucked away safe somewhere, which at a glance, it kind of looks like he ditched the kid just so he can go and get some from his ex, though he genuinely did this to keep Rotha safe. But as it turns out, Tulip needs to meet Rotha because that kid knows the most about the Adana out of the three of them. And if Tulip is gonna help Blade find the right weapon, she has to know what exactly it is that Blade's trying to kill. And in the middle of this talk, an attack chopper just flies up to the window of her condo, letting off a railgun and just tearing this place apart. Which again, just goes back to Blade's reasoning for taking Rotha somewhere safe, instead of just dragging her right into Tulip's very dangerous world. But also for Tulip, as a benefit of being an occult arms dealer, and perhaps more of a precaution than a benefit, she keeps a weapon stash, packed with guns and knives of all sorts, with each of them having some sort of supernatural enhancement. So Blade just grabs one, and he's more or less just like, hey, as long as this thing kills people, it'll do what he needs it to do. So from there, he just jumps out the window and into the chopper, serving one shots to everybody inside, which takes care of these guys before he jumps back in. But in addition to them, there's also a ground crew, who follows up right after by blasting through her front door, catching the two of them off guard and shooting Blade right back out the window, which from here creates an entirely new issue, cause these guys end up tasing Tulip and taking her. And as for Blade, though he's able to survive this kind of fall, by the time he gets up, it's only soon enough for him to see these guys grab Tulip, drag her into a car and take her away. And this whole fiasco really just shows Blade that Tulip has gotten herself into something where she's just in way over her head. So if he's going to get her help to find a way to stop the Adana, he's going to need her alive. So that means solving her problem before they can even get to his. So next, Blade makes his way to go free Rotha, who of course is pissed because the kid's been tied to a post the whole night. So he unties her and he feeds her breakfast while filling her in about the situation with Tulip. So Rotha asks, is Tulip a good person? Because to her, violence must be done with righteousness behind it. And as far as she's concerned, her brothers and sisters from the swordsman sect, they had lost their way, and that's the only reason she justified to herself killing them to save Blade. So for a moment here, she cuts out the bottom of Blade's cup while he's holding it to more or less show him that she is capable, and she wants to go along to help Blade and save Tulip, but he's gotta understand that she's not just some defenseless and helpless kid. And in the case of Tulip, when we head back over to her, we find out that the men who are after her, they work for Lord Diodo, because as it turns out, he bought some bullets from Tulip not too long ago that were supposed to be able to kill people and raise them from the dead so that he could amass this crazy huge undead army. But come to find out, Tulip just sold him some regular bullets because she didn't think that him having an undead army would be much of a good thing for anybody else. And the problem isn't so much that Tulip disagrees with Lord Dido, but it's more so the case of her taking his money and not delivering what she had promised. Which, I mean, sounds like a reasonable argument. But just before Tulip begins to get tortured to death, they hear a car explosion outside. So Lord Dido's men go to check it out. But as soon as they step outside, they start getting picked off with arrows by Rotha, who's really hoping that these are actually bad guys that she's killing. And meanwhile inside, with Blade making his way to Lord Dido, it's here where he properly introduces himself to Blade as the invader of thoughts and the conqueror of minds, which really in a lot of ways is our introduction to him, because otherwise all we really know is that he's super old, super rich, and super powerful, as far as Japanese and mortal crime bosses go. But to this guy's surprise, Blade is able to resist his mind control spell, which is something we've seen Blade do from time to time. But right here with Lord Diodo asks, how is this possible? And how is Blade able to resist? Blade just tells him the same way that he always does, which is by getting pissed off. So he breaks free and stabs Lord Diodo with a solution that soon after causes his head to explode. But now with them finally getting both Tulip and Rotha to sit together and figure out what Blade is up against and what type of weapon he'll need, for a moment this still kind has Tulip asking what exactly is in it for her, as if saving her life multiple times just wasn't enough. But it isn't too long before she shares with them a story about a sword 
that she says she's not sure if it really exists. But even with her saying this, Rotha can tell that Tulip truly believes that it does. So Tulip goes on to tell the story by saying when Lucifer was created, he was supposed to be the greatest warrior of God, with God creating the dichotomy of both good and evil and choosing Lucifer to preserve the order of all things. And to carry out this task, God gave Lucifer a special sword made from the matter of creation itself that he shared the same name with. So for that reason, the sword was named Lightbringer. Which now for Blade, after hearing this story, he's just like, okay, so all I gotta do is steal a sword from the devil, and that's light work. But as it turns out, that's not quite the case at the moment, because right now the sword's being held in the possession of Hamilton Achilles, the owner of Achilles Industries. And the way that Tulip describes him, she's just like, imagine Tony Stark, but replace the technology with brutality. But in the big picture, he's mainly just a huge arms dealer. And the rumor is that he has the Lightbringer sword in his possession. So for Blade, he's just like, yeah, well, okay, we just go to him and we take it. But the problem is, this guy lives on a train that's also a fortress, and it's constantly moving at 150 miles per hour. So it's not gonna be as easy as Blade is making it sound for them to just run up in there and take what they want. But for Tulip, she doesn't want anything to do with this train fortress heist. She's told Blade what he needs to know, and she's just like, from here, that's on you. But furthermore, Blade needs specifics. He needs a location of the train, details about what they're up against inside, and Tulip's just like, nah, what you need is the Hulk. And unfortunately, she does not have his number. And the funny thing is, she tells them this whole thing is a suicide mission. So Rotha tells her, that doesn't even matter, because if they don't stop the Adana, then it's the end of the world for everybody. So Tulip is just like, I'll be wearing Gucci and drinking a martini when it happens. Which, I mean, I guess that's one way to look at it. But also, this conversation has Rotha asking Blade what exactly is a martini. Because again, this kid was raised on a mountain. So Blade just tells her it's water for grown folks. And just in the nick of time, he tells both of them to get down as a litter of arrows come flying through the window. And it shows us right away that this time, it's not Tulip who's being sought after. It's Rotha's brothers and sisters who've made their way here to find her and handle Blade. Because they still believe that they owe him a slow and painful death after killing their fellow brother who trained his whole life to kill the Adana. So quickly, Tulip asked Rotha if she's cool with her killing these guys. So for Rotha, just like she told Blade, her brothers and sisters are lost. So she's not gonna try and stop her. So Tulip just headshots this guy as Blade steps outside to handle the others. But when a few of these guys shoot their arrows at Blade, these arrows just stop in midair. And seemingly out of nowhere, a magic spell just knocks the rest of these guys out. And we soon after discover that all this magic is being done by Doctor Strange, who's made his way over to Japan to tell Blade, I hear you're the one responsible for our collision course with Armageddon. I'm not angry, I'm disappointed. All right, so when we come back, we pick up from not long after Doctor Strange made his way to Japan to speak to Blade about him recently starting the end of the world. And right off the bat, Doctor Strange is ready to get down to business by just focusing on the solution. Because like we saw, Blade was already preparing to go after Hamilton Achilles, who's this super rich and evil collector that lives on a train with an adamantium chassis that rarely slows down below 180 miles per hour. And even though prior to this point, we already got the rundown about Hamilton Achilles, at least in a general sense, back when Tulip told Blade everything that she knew according to her sources, you know, with her being an occult arms dealer and everything. But even still, Tulip wasn't completely certain about the specifics surrounding Achilles. But this time around with Doctor Strange sharing the deets, not only is he completely certain about his information, but he can also confirm that Lucifer's sword is on this train. And to take it a step further, Doctor Strange can get them on the train. Because again, from the moment he got here, Strange has been in solution mode. And there's a little bit more to it that we'll talk about in a moment. But first, because Strange has just hopped into the heist details, if you will, Blade takes a moment to introduce Tulip and Rotha, or at least try to only for Strange to cut him off and just run down their character bio real quick. Cause Doctor Strange already knows who they are, which is really not that far-fetched of a thing because he's the Sorcerer Supreme and it's literally his job to be aware of the occult world, even if he's not always stepping in to each and every conflict. But when this happens, it's funny how even though we're familiar with both Tulip and Rotha, Doctor Strange yet again takes it a step further because he mentions that there's a bit of sexual tension between Tulip and Blade, which is very true. But in addition to that, he also tells them that Rotha admires Blade in a misguided near parental way, which is something that I really hadn't thought about up to this point because now it's possible that Rotha might become like a second daughter to Blade. 
But again, Doctor Strange is sharing these details because these are things that he already knew. And from the looks of it, the three of them have already sized up each other's dynamics. So even without them talking to each other about these things, for the most part, they've already noticed the dynamics between each other. And even though Strange just got here, he's already aware of all of this because he's the Sorcerer Supreme and that's his job. But even still, like we talked about in the return of Doctor Strange, there are some things that do get past him. So it's not like he never misses anything, but for the amount that he does keep up with, it's impressive. And so next, when Blade goes on to ask Strange if there's any additional information that he could give him on Hamilton Achilles to more or less let Blade know what exactly he's walking into, Strange tells him that he's going into a situation that he's quite familiar with because Hamilton Achilles is more than just an arms dealer with a crazy obsession for personal safety, but he is also a vampire, which for Blade, hearing this just has him like, oh, goody. And Doctor Strange tells him, I thought you'd be pleased to hear that. Another opportunity to act out your childhood trauma, which to be honest, coming from Doctor Strange is a really crass way to put things. So Blade calls him out on it, telling him that he's a bit more grumpy today than usual, which is true, because since Strange has gotten here, He's been quite upset about Blade releasing the Adana, and it doesn't help that just recently in Romania, the Adana slaughtered a group of sorcerers who were under the charge of Doctor Strange. So to him, not only is this fresh because it literally just happened, but also these guys were woefully outmatched and they went up against the Adana who was expecting to go against Doctor Strange. And they all were killed, slowly and painfully. And this is the reason why Doctor Strange has been feeling some type of way towards Blade from the moment we saw him arrive here in Japan. So Blade reminds him that he didn't set free the Adana intentionally. And Doctor Strange is more or less like, oh, oh, it was a mistake. My apologies, where are my manners? Which to me, that just feels like Strange going back to his usual levels of sarcasm. So from here, he opens a doorway for Blade, Tulip, and Rotha to make their way onto the train so they can take Lucifer's sword and use it to stop the Adana. And Doctor Strange even makes sure to send the three of them to a part of the train that is the least occupied. So when they get there, there's only one guard who turns around and sees them at the last minute. So Blade just cuts this dude in half before he can even get off a shot. And from here, Blade tells them that he's going to move forward on the train to go after Hamilton Achilles and get Lucifer's sword while the two of them make their way to the rear because Doctor Strange also mentioned that there are prisoners on this train, so they need to get them out of here. And going forward, as we follow Blade, we're given a very modern signature Blade moment because in the next card ahead, there's a ton of vampires and Blade's just like, fellas, all I want to do is kill your boss and take his stuff. You boys got a problem with that? And these vampires just hiss and snarl before they just rush at him. So Blade just smirks and he's like, good, just before he slices all these vampires into pieces. And for me, it's moments like this that just remind me about how much the character of Blade has changed ever since the first Blade film with Wesley Snipes back in 98. Because I remember when I heard that movie was coming. And I think at the time I read it in like Wizard Magazine or something. But I remember my reaction just being like, Blade? The dude from the Night Stalkers? Because in the 90s, most of the comics I had were X-Men, much like any other kid. And back then, prior to the internet being what it is today, most of what I learned outside of X-Men, Spider-Man, Hulk, and a couple of Secret Wars issues that I had came from talking to friends, reading Wizard Magazine, or collecting trading cards. So back then, everything I knew about Blade was from reading the back of trading cards, because nobody else I knew was checking for Blade prior to that movie. And in my experience, that changed drastically after. But enough of the rant, back to the story. Because right now, as Blade is making his way forward on the train, he hears Hamilton Achilles on the intercom, telling him that the Adana has spoken to him, and she told Achilles ahead of time that Blade would come. So going forward, he opens the way for Blade to approach and speak to him face to face. But for a moment here, we go back to Tulip and Rotha, who've made their way to the rear of the train to free the prisoners who were pretty much food, locked away waiting to be eaten by Hamilton Achilles and his staff. And it's not until now where Tulip realizes that all of these goons are vampires. And it has Tulip more or less saying that, hey, Doctor Strange failed to mention that all of these guys were vampires. And in Rotha's case, she more or less assumed as much when Strange first told them about Achilles. So Tulip makes the adjustment. But when we go back over to Blade, who's explaining to Achilles that he's come to borrow something that he's never going to give back, which is a polite way of saying that he's come here to steal Lucifer's sword, Lightbringer. But for Achilles, who's been instructed by the Adana to anticipate Blade's arrival, he didn't know until now what specifically Blade was after. And now that he does, he tells Blade that this sword is going to change him. And that's all part of the Adana's plan. But also for Achilles, with him just finding this out, he's not quite ready to part with one of the rarest artifacts in his collection. So for that reason, he doesn't let it go without a fight. 
And while they're here fighting, the Adana is talking to Achilles right now. And just like we were told by Tanaka in issue one, Blade's not able to hear her because he's a half-blood. So right now as the Adana is talking to Achilles, he tells Blade that her voice sounds like music. And it's really one of those things where her influence is so strong on Achilles that she instructs him to delete himself. So he does it right away without hesitation. Cause again, the Adana doesn't want Achilles getting in the way. She wants Blade to take this sword. And as soon as Achilles is gone, Doctor Strange shows up telling Blade that this is wrong and to give him the sword. But Blade refuses to, cause from what he knows, this is the only way to stop the Adana. So Strange tells him that he saw what's coming and it's something that neither of them want to happen. Which in a way just lets us know that Doctor Strange is aware of quite a bit more than what he's sharing. And he even admits in a way that he's being very intentional as far as the ways that he's able to actually help Blade. But right now his Blade is just saying that he can handle it over and over until he drops to his knees. Strange lets him know that's the pride speaking because the Lightbringer is the sword of Lucifer himself. And though it's immensely powerful, whoever wields it, they inherit Lucifer's pride as well. But going forward, Doctor Strange doesn't press the issue. He doesn't try to take the sword away from Blade, but instead he just tells Blade, I have seen my path. I cannot help you face her. It will be my role to stop what the Adana is about to do. Your friends and the innocents have been sent to safety. Leave this train to me. And when you feel that pride inside of you, like snow falling over your reason and judgment, just know that Lucifer, the Morning Star, was a bastion of pride. Now you have his sword and pride goeth before the fall. Which again is Doctor Strange being cryptic and also very intentional about the limitations of his involvement here. But even still with that being the case, you can tell that he's still doing what he believes to be his part to help Blade in the larger picture. But unfortunately, there are parts of the Adonis plan that even Doctor Strange isn't able to see. Cause now as Blade, Tulip and Rotha make their way to the Adana, it just so happens that the sword Blade brought with them, the Lightbringer, is the same shape as the key that the Adana needs to open a gateway that'll release the primordial wave. All right, so coming back, we continue with Blade who's made his way to the Adana, armed with Lucifer's sword, Lightbringer, with both Tulip and Rotha at his side. But as we dive in here, we find that everything's gone dark and all Blade hears is the voice of Doctor Strange asking, what do you remember? But right now, Blade is just trying to gather himself because he only remembers bits and pieces of what happened after he got here with Tulip and Rotha because he remembers Tulip shooting, as well as the Adana breaking his wrist and taking Lucifer's sword. And the only thing Blade knows for certain is that he walked right into a trap. So he asks Doctor Strange, what did the Adana do? And right now, as soon as we look around, there's nothing but bodies everywhere. So Doctor Strange just tells Blade, the Adana used the sword to open a gateway that was acting as a dam against the primordial wave. And Doctor Strange didn't realize what the Adana's intent was, until it was too late. Cause right now, all over the world, the Adana has awoken occult powers that have been dormant in people far and wide. With this primordial wave being released, similar to how the Terrigen Mist would unlock in humans dormant abilities. But in this case, it's with monsters and it's a lot more interesting. So Doctor Strange asks Blade if he can feel it, but Blade tells him all he feels is anger. And all Blade cares about right now is knowing where his friends are. Where's Tulip and Rotha? And Strange tells him they're in the consequence of coming with you of trusting your passion over good judgment. They are where you put them, to where from here, Doctor Strange then takes Blade to them. And after this, we head over to the Adana, where right now she's gathered a number of the people who had recently had their occult powers unlocked. And it's really the case where after the Adana awoken their abilities, she put out a call. And this is the first group of people who answered. So she tells them a great hour's upon us, and you have waited so long, referring to their once dormant abilities that have now come forth. And she asks them all, do you see? And they all respond, we see. And she goes on to tell them, you have come to me, but you do not know me, what I am. I am Adana, the great mother of the dark. I am evil, but the word has lost itself in the weakness of time. This world believes evil is an unkind word. The governments of man at war, the petty cruelness of the fragile human soul. Evil is so much more than what this world fears. Evil is more than a messiah's despair on Roman wood. Evil is the source of all things. It is the light that is a lie. Do you see? And all those who have gathered, they say we see. So the Adana goes on to say, I have awakened so many. The gate is opened, but this age has yet to begin. Creation was not born gently. It was born in the fire and hatred and the collision of stars. And I saw it. And soon this world will see us. We will no longer hide. We will claim. We will rend the lie of civilization. Do you see? 
And right there, everyone who's gathered here, they say, we see. And really just with hearing that speech, we now have a clearer picture of the Adana's main goal. And now when we go back to Blade, we find Doctor Strange showing him that the Adana placed a demon inside of Tulip and for no other reason than to just punish Blade. So Blade asks if Doctor Strange can just take it out of her. But unfortunately, even as the Sorcerer Supreme, Strange is not able to because it's soul bound. And this whole time, Tulip is just begging for somebody to kill her and put her out of her misery because she is in excruciating pain. So Doctor Strange looks at Blade out of the corner of his eye and tells him it would be merciful to end her. But you won't do that, I assume. And Blade tells him no. So Strange tells him neither will I. So he gives Tulip the Amulet of Eden to reduce her pain until they can find a more permanent solution. And it works well enough to bring Tulip back to a coherent state. But much like Blade, she doesn't recall what happened when they lost to the Adana. All Tulip remembers is that she touched her and after that it was nothing but pain. So from here, Blade has a conversation with Doctor Strange, if that's what you want to call it. Because really it's more of a passive aggressive argument because the two of these guys have very different opinions on what the next move should be because Blade's ready to take action. And it leads to Doctor Strange having to point out the obvious problem here, because as it stands right now, Blade has no weapon that can harm the Adana. And it just has Blade like, okay, well then what do we do? Should we just sit here and hope that she changes her mind? And Blade even asked how many people were harmed because he didn't stop the Adana from opening that gate. And Strange tells him it was many. So Blade tells Strange to stop being a coward and put him wherever the Adana's at. Because for Blade, the thing is he's just ready to do something before more people are hurt or the Adana progresses even further. But for Doctor Strange, the way he sees it, they need to have a plan. So he tells Blade what they need to do is take a step back before they make their next move forward. And I mean, I gotta admit, I'm with Strange on this one. But Blade's just not trying to hear that. So he knocks over an expensive vase while telling Strange to take him to the Adana before he breaks something else. Because if he needs to, he'll break everything in his room. But Strange just reassembles it while telling Blade that he can break whatever he wants and Strange will just put it back together. But Blade goes on to get a bit more specific by telling Strange that he's in the room too. So he's one of the things that are going to get broken. So right here, Doctor Strange gets ready to send Blade off to the Adana. And it's not at all because of the threat. But instead, it more so leans into something we've been talking about in the comments quite a bit lately. Because a lot of you guys have noticed that Doctor Strange is just tired of people. And that's really what's going on here. Because first he tells Blade about himself. And he lets him know how everyone just thinks that Blade is so stoic. And Strange is like, nah, Steve Rogers is stoic. You, Blade, are a jackass. And from there, Strange goes on to explain the situation of what needs to be done to get Blade to the Adana. But you can very much tell that Strange thinks this is a dumb idea, but he's going to go ahead and let Blade do it. He's just simply stepping out of the way. And he goes on to let Blade know that the Adana can move between realms. In the place that she's at now, though it's not literally hell, the conditions of this realm are very similar to it. So Doctor Strange ends up sending Blade there. Because for Blade, his plan is pretty much, you know, just send me to the Adana and I'll handle the rest. And there's really not much more to it. And as Blade lands in this realm, one of the first things that he notices is that the ground is saturated with blood. And soon after, he's greeted by the Adana, who tells Blade right away that Strange was wrong about this place when he mentioned earlier that it's not actually hell. Because there are many hells, and this one is hers. So she makes sure not only to make that correction, but also make that distinction clear as well. Because since Blade has released her, she's been growing stronger by the day. And in fact, she made this little dimension just so she could wait here for Blade, which she admits is a bit extra. But right here, unexpectedly, she just tosses Lucifer's sword at Blade's feet, giving him the opportunity to get revenge for what she did to Tulip. So without hesitation, Blade picks up the sword because he's trying to end this anyway. But when he leaps towards the Adana with the intention of thrusting this sword through her, she just stops him in midair with the wave of a finger as she lets Blade know that she's not interested in finding him again and doing the age old, same old monotonous song and dance. Cause to her, conflict is pointless. Day fades into night and the night is here. So she tells him, rather than trying to fight her, he should be asking what it is that she wants. Cause it's few people who actually ask that question. And at first for Blade, he's just like, hey, I don't even care. Cause he just wants to find a way to destroy her and be done with it. And even without Blade asking, the Adana goes on to tell him that she just wants freedom for all things. Because when everyone's a monster, there are monsters no more. 
And that just had me like, man, well, that's a good point. And after that, she just tells Blade, I have no issue with you because you are another thing I'm here to save. So you can go back to your world. You will not see me again. Our business is done. This is goodbye, but you will come to know my works. So she sends Blade back, but not without setting him on fire as a show of power. And it's really just one of those things where it's like the Adana's been playing with Blade from the moment they met, but now she's switching gears and she wants to send a message to let him know he can't stop what's coming. But after Blade gets back, he ends up leaving and telling Rotha to look after Tula. But before he leaves, Rotha reminds him that her people are going to continue to go after him. So he just tells her if she cares about them, she should try to change their minds. And just after this, we end up seeing what Blade's next move is. And as this happens, I'm not really sure what's more impressive, whether it's what he's doing or the fact of him doing this with Lucifer's sword in his possession. Cause from here we see Blade head to his next destination. And at first it's a bit of a mystery as far as who he's talking to. But as Blade walks in, he goes on to say, I'm here without pride. I'm here because I've been making this too easy for too long. You see what's happening in the world. I know you feel what the Adana did, what I helped her do, how I failed. I need to do what I've been afraid of doing my whole life. I know you can help me. Sometimes I think you let me win because there are things you're afraid of doing too. Power, even you are afraid to take. I am not afraid anymore. Show me everything you know about what I am. All of it, no rules. Teach me, cause it's here. When we find that Blade has made his way to Dracula so that he can teach Blade how to reach his full potential and how to win this war. All right, so coming back, we continue with Blade, who's made his way to Dracula's home in Chernobyl to ever so humbly ask for Dracula's help with learning more about himself as well as how to win his war with the Adana. Because like we've seen so far in this series, after Blade was tricked into releasing the Adana, the mother of evil, she has made it clear on a number of occasions that he is woefully underpowered, which has caused Blade to come to the conclusion if he's going to stop her, he needs to reach his fullest potential. So for Blade, it just seemed like the logical answer for him to go to Dracula, who not only knows what Blade is through and through, but he also has centuries of war experience that could aid Blade in the fight to come. So to start this out, Dracula just has Blade fighting a ton of blood zombies. And the reason why Dracula has him doing this is so that he can observe and evaluate where Blade is at and where he may have gone wrong, which is very different than just going off of times past when Blade and Dracula fought each other. Cause now this is Dracula taking the opportunity to stand aside and make his observations on where Blade is now. And it isn't long before Dracula tells Blade enough. I've seen what I need to see and I know why you failed. Which right there, I imagine for Blade, that's gotta hurt the pride a little bit. Cause he's probably thinking like, man, come on, you don't know what I was about to do. Cause all that could have been me setting up something new. You don't know me. But just after this, the first thing that Blade says is you never told me you can make blood zombies. And Dracula just replies, you never asked. Which to me, it's one of the things that I really like about this whole setup here. Because even though Dracula's Blade's sworn enemy, there's still this unspoken understanding between the two of them. Because oftentimes when we see Dracula show up in Marvel Comics, he's usually given the twisty mustache villain treatment. And to be fair, in recent years, I will say that we have gotten to see more of his calculated and strategic side, like in the 2018 Avengers run with the rise of Vampire Nation. But for a long time, just as a character, I feel like there's been a lot of untapped potential because it's rare that we really look into Dracula with a story that talks about who he is and who he was. Because there's a few times where we talk about it here, and I'm digging it. But next, Dracula tells Blade, You came to me to learn, to stop this Adana. What do you think I can teach you? So Blade tells him how to use evil against evil. So Dracula's then like, I see, and you believe that I am evil. And I mean, right there, Blade is just like, well, yeah. Because there's not too many people who are going to argue with that statement. But Dracula just goes on to let him know that Blade's problem is perspective. It's not power. It's not that he lacks the skill. But instead, it's that he's blind to the forces that exist inside of him. And the Adana, who sees all, she knows this. So he lets Blade know until he embraces himself, he will not be able to destroy her. So for Blade, with him knowing that all the occult creatures from around the world can sense the Adana's arrival, Blade knows that Dracula was aware of her before he even came here. So Blade more or less tells Dracula that he doesn't think Dracula cares about the Adana or even her winning because he seems unbothered. But Dracula tells him it's dangerous to assume intentions. I love this world more than you can know. 
to where from there he tells Blade to follow him back inside, as he goes on to explain to Blade how they have more in common than he realizes. Cause there was a time centuries ago, before he became the Prince of Darkness, when he was Vlad the Impaler, and he fought against evil, using his sword and his anger, and he asked Blade, does any of this sound familiar? As he goes on to show Blade the armor he used to wear, while telling him, I wore this as a knight in the legions of the righteous. Evil first knew me because I hunted it. I fought for the god I believed loved us. I served his cross. I spilled blood to protect the world because back then I thought I knew what evil was. And then when I became this, I learned that I knew nothing. You need to learn what you do not know. So right there he turns around and tells Blade to attack him. And it throws Blade off at first, but not after long he realizes that it's time for another lesson. Cause now Dracula wants Blade to practice his anger. And the truth is, he's not worried about Blade actually trying to kill him here. Because if Blade could have put Dracula down for good, he would have done it by now. And we're not talking about alternate timelines. Like in Dark Ages when Blade killed Apocalypse and Dracula. But if you're interested in seeing that story, I got a link in the description just below that like button. But in this case, there's a few things that Dracula is trying to show Blade. Because on the surface, he does want Blade to continue to fight with his anger. He wants him to use that. But also, Dracula is giving Blade a demonstration of how for himself, accepting who and what he is, has completely changed him from who he once was when he was only a man. Because that's what he's trying to get Blade to step into. So as Blade attacks, at one point, Dracula just turns to fog. And at another point, he just turns into a bunch of bats. As he lets Blade know, if you think like a man, then you will have the limits of a man. And you can tell even right now that Blade doesn't fully comprehend this. Because right now, Blade is just like, man, what you mean? I'm half man, half amazing. <laughs> but no, seriously, Blade tells Dracula, I am a man. Which for him, it's why he's trained the way he has. And he fights the way he does, even post Morbius. But in response, Dracula tells him, you wish to be, just as I did. But you are no longer a man, and you will never be again. So from here, Dracula just continues to showcase his different abilities as he summons the Soulless, who are practically a bunch of zombies to go after Blade. But Dracula's intention with doing this is just to send in so many that it forces Blade to get out of his air quotes, pretty fighting style so that he's just overwhelmed to the point that it forces Blade to tap into his feral untamed anger. And it works. Because from here, Blade just goes to ripping off arms and all sorts of limbs. He's pulling bodies in half, taking their insides, pulling them outside. He's going crazy. But this is precisely what Dracula wanted to show him. Because what Blade has done here, this is not the work of a man. And if Blade wants to destroy the Adana, a charmed sword is not going to help. He's going to have to become the evil that he hates. And Dracula tells him he's got to embrace its power, our power, evil against evil. So Dracula tells Blade to follow him to the next room because they're not done. But also he lets Blade know that he doesn't need to worry about him telling everyone how much Blade enjoyed that because really that whole thing was just for educational purposes. So Dracula's just like, we'll leave it at that. But because in that moment, Blade only touched his nature and that was only a glimpse of the power he has inside, Dracula tells him that that's good, but not good enough. So he ends up pouring out a portion of his blood and telling Blade to drink it because it would take generations for Blade to truly unleash himself by way of just traditional training. And given the circumstances, the Adana is not giving Blade that long. And of course, with Blade being offered Dracula's blood to drink, his initial answer is no. But Dracula's like, come on, man, you know they got DMT for traumatized mind, Adderall for an overactive child, this ain't no different. But Blade just keeps saying no, because for him, he can't help but to think that there's got to be some sort of catch. So Dracula tells him this is no sort of ruse. All it will do is show you your shadow and mine. Drink. So Blade asks, to receive your power? At what price? So he makes it clear that this isn't Dracula giving his powers to Blade, but instead by drinking his blood, this will give Blade a deeper connection to his own. So he lets Blade know the only price that he'll pay is pain. So right there, Blade's just like, all right, if it's just pain. So Blade drinks it and it goes down like a shot of Bacardi 151. Because right away, we see Blade in pain after drinking Dracula's blood with no chaser. <laughs> to where then moments later, after Blade has more or less gathered himself, Dracula tells him, now, show me evil. To where this time around, Dracula goes on the offense. But as he leaps in to attack Blade, Blade transforms into fog to avoid the attack before re-solidifying himself on the other side of the room. So from here, Dracula tells him, you feel the connection, the bond to shadow itself, 
Now you can smell every trace of soul that has passed through this space. You have the bloodline of eternity in your veins. I believe what you should feel is gratitude. As he goes on to ask Blade, are you a man? And Blade tells him not anymore. And after that, Dracula's is just like, he's done enough for Blade. So he tells him more or less, get the hell out of my house, Daywalker. As Dracula just leaves the room. And next, from here, we head over to Bruce Banner, who we see on the phone saying, Blade, the things you said would be happening with the Adana, these things are happening here. It's something you need to come see and don't take long because I'm getting angry. Which right there just lets us know that we're getting ready for a Hulk Blade crossover. That really makes a lot of sense with everything that's been going on in the Hulk series, with Bruce having his own case of primordial run-ins as well. So I'm excited to see how all of this actually comes together. All right, so coming back, we head over to the Pacific Northwest, where we find the Hulk fighting this group of monsters who really aren't anything that's too much for the Hulk, but because of the way that they're fighting him, moving like they just have one mind, it makes this more frustrating for the Hulk than anything else. So as soon as the Hulk swings for one, another steps in and bites him on the shoulder, like they all just know what the other one's thinking. And usually this is one of those things where the Hulk eventually figures it out. And as soon as he does, it's over. Like he finds that rhythm and then they're done. But before this even gets to that point, someone else comes through with a katana, just slicing and dicing, cutting through these monsters and just causing the last two to just flee. And as the Hulk turns around, he sees that it's Blade. And at first, Hulk really doesn't know what to think of it, whether Blade has come here to fight or what. So Blade just tells Hulk to calm down. And he says, you called me, remember? Which right there just lets Hulk know that it was Banner who called Blade. So Hulk begrudgingly reverts back to Banner so the two of these guys can go ahead and figure this out. So Blade gives Banner his coat and they make their way to a nearby diner where here, Blade's trying to figure out what exactly is going on, as far as Banner even being out here to begin with. Because Blade tells him, like, let me guess, you were just passing through and you stumbled across a town full of monsters, which for Banner is not really the case. So Blade just grabs him a cup of coffee, since nobody else is here. As Banner goes on to tell him, when he first got here, the town appeared empty, and he needed some alone time, which I assume is him stepping away from Charlie for a little bit, but not long after making his way here, he noticed that those things would mostly come out at night. And the reason why at nighttime nobody's ever really around is because the people in this town, they all take refuge in the church, and those creatures don't like the church. So for a moment, Banner tries to switch up the conversation and ask Blade, how's Yumi-san, who's a mutual friend of theirs that Blade would describe as a mirror. And on separate occasions, they've both gone to see her to get her perspective. And it's really more of a once a year thing, for Blade at least. But the thing that's interesting about Banner even mentioning her is that on Blade's most recent visit, Yumi-san told Blade that he had a lot in common with a doctor who had came to see her recently, which at the time, during Blade first bite when we were shown this, it was really clear that she was talking about Banner. And it circles back around to what we've been seeing with Blade throughout this series, with us often seeing him expressing that he's feeling anger or fire, which were things that came out during his last meeting with Yumi-san. Because at the time, she also let Blade know that in his case, his anger is just fear, wearing a disguise, because Blade fears accepting what he truly is. And really, it was this conversation that eventually caused Blade to seek out Dracula's counsel and get the power upgrade to help him face the Adana, because it was during this talk with Yumi when he remembered that Dracula told him years ago that Blade would never be free until he surrendered to evil. Which, like we saw in our recent talk when Dracula was training Blade, this was a huge part of what Dracula was trying to get him to open up to, to fully unlock Blade's potential. And I got a feeling that there's a whole new level that we haven't seen when it comes down to the new abilities that Blade has recently unlocked. But nonetheless, right now with Banner trying to switch up the conversation, Blade's not going for it. So he keeps asking Banner, why did you call me? So Banner just tells him he called because he doesn't have Doctor Strange's number. So Blade just tells Banner, like, you know, Doctor Strange is a little irritated with him right now because he released a primordial demon called the Adana. He lost the only weapon that could destroy it and he got some friends hurt. And he goes on to say that's probably the reason why these creatures that popped up came here too. And Banner can definitely relate when it comes to being the reason why monsters are popping up in random places. But going back to the problem at hand, Blade just throws a simple solution out there. Because he tells Banner those things that were attacking, 
they moved like they were part of a hive mind. So all Banner's gotta do is find who's controlling the hive and use the Hulk to punch them really hard. But Banner lets him know that it's not that simple. And this is actually the reason why he called. Cause when he called, he told Blade he was getting angry. So from here, he takes Blade over to the nearby church to show him about the part that was making him angry. Cause as it turns out, one of the couples in this town their son Ronnie went out running into the woods in the middle of the night but when he came back he wasn't himself because at first he attacked his mom with a kitchen knife then right after that he coughed up one of those creatures and then he just took off and over time more and more of those creatures would show up at night all around the town and for a moment the father who's telling this story he looks at Banner and he tells him like oh man Dr. B I don't know how you made it out here to us in the middle of all that we're right there banner's just like well you know i'm tougher than i look and the father's just like what's inside my boy caused all this can you help me can you help us dr b you said you can help us and right there blade is just like did he and he tells banner dr b let me talk to you for a second so the two of them go off to the side and blade is just like man that boy possessed and bruce is like well you see why i couldn't punch him and Blade tells him, man, I'm not an exorcist. So Banner kind of flips it around because he tells Blade that he understands the science of this. So instead of trying to exorcise this creature out of this kid, he just tells Blade that everything has its own science. So in other words, just how do we solve this problem? Or better yet, just going off of what Blade knows, what would be the logical solution? Which for Blade, there's only two ways he can think of when it comes to someone being possessed. Cause for one, you can force it out with skill, which again, is not his expertise. Cause if it were, I'm sure he would have been went back and helped Tulip. And the second option he comes up with is to get this thing to come out on its own. Cause if it's something you can talk to, then it's likely that you can bargain with it. So from here, Blade goes to this family's house and he makes his way up to Ronnie's room to strike a deal with whatever this thing is that's possessing the kid. Cause Blade's not even sure about what he's looking at right now. And it's more or less looking back at Blade the same way. Cause it can tell that Blade is something unique, though it's not quite sure what exactly. So when Blade offers for this thing to possess him instead, Blade tells it that unlike the kid, he actually has power. Which again, this thing can sense, but it doesn't know what kind of power Blade's talking about. So Blade shows it by turning into a wolf, which for Blade, this is some of his more recently obtained abilities being put on display after his training with Dracula. So he shows it off and tells this thing, take me, leave the boy, I will give you everything I am. And this thing totally goes for it because it can tell that this is more power than what it has. So it's just like, yeah, give me that, that's a come up. So going forward, it leaves Ronnie, jumps into Blade, so Blade uses it to control the hive and lure all the other monsters out away from the town at sunrise. And Blade takes them all out to a nice open field where the Hulk's waiting. And after that, the Hulk just beats the mess out of these things, which is a lot easier now since Blade is in control of the hive. So he just makes them all stand there and take it. And when the Hulk's done, Blade just throws this thing up because really from the time that this thing jumped into Blade, it knew that something was up because at no point was it actually in control. But just after Blade spits it out, Hulk steps on its head and that's it. And after this is done, Banner asks Blade if it was difficult keeping that thing from taking control, which then has Blade like, I can ask you the same question. But if you think about it, this is one of the places where the two of these guys are very different. Cause for Banner, when he hulks out, he has no control. But when it comes to Blade, the angrier he is, the more control he has. And we saw an example of this back in issue three, when Blade broke free of Lord Dido's influence. So anger works really differently for the two of these guys. And if anything, I'd say that it benefits the Hulk more than it does Banner. But just after this, Blade tells Bruce that he's leaving to figure out this whole situation with the Adana, which then has Bruce more or less like, well, what does that mean? Because before, Blade made it sound like it was impossible. But as it turns out, when Blade had that creature inside of him, he saw where he needed to go. So Banner asked, what did he see? And as Blade rides off, he tells Dr. Banner, hell because now Blade needs to go to hell. And I imagine it's a different one than the bespoke hell that he visited recently. So from here, Blade rides off and Banner's just like, in the end, I think that's where we're all going. And I'm just like, shoot, not me. But I do imagine with the way that Banner's story is shaping out, his conflict with the eldest is gonna take him for quite the ride. And I wouldn't be surprised if when we get to that point in the Hulk series, when the conflict expands like crazy, we end up seeing Banner visit somewhere very similar in the not too distant future. All right, so coming back from our last talk, 
where we saw Blade answering Bruce Banner's call to help him out with an issue going on in the Pacific Northwest. We go on to follow Blade as he heads down to Los Angeles so he can get help from an old friend. And I do use the term friend loosely because the next step in Blade's plan to defeat the Adana, it involves him going to hell and building an army of the damned. So to do this, he needs someone to help him get there. And I mean in a way that's easy for him to come back because I mean anybody can help get to hell. <laughs> but we talking about a round trip here. So to do this, he sought out the help of Satana, the devil's daughter, who also once upon a time was Deadpool's wife. And I don't know, it could be me, but it almost seems like we're seeing more Deadpool references just randomly popping up. Or maybe that's just my mind looking for more Deadpool connections lately. But going into this, all you really need to know about Satana is that her and Blade have worked together in the past, like during the war at the gates of hell, when a sorcerer named Necrodamus was looking to give Hell an advantage against Heaven. So the two of them teamed up with Ghost Rider and her brother Damien to stop this. But over the years, she's definitely stood in that gray area between good and evil, like the time when Doctor Strange arrived in her all new, all different Hell, and she tried to trick him by getting him to eat a piece of Hell bacon, which was practically poison, so that Steven would die there and his soul would belong to her. So yeah, with Satana, you really don't know what you're gonna get, because in the past, even when she's doing a good deed, Underneath, there's also a bit of a struggle because she's going against her devilish nature. But nonetheless, with Blade coming to her for help, to Satana, that's pretty much a clear sign that he doesn't have too many other options at the moment. So at first, even though she knows she's willing to help, she still can't resist the urge to tease him at first by taking Blade the whole why should I help you song and dance. And Blade goes through the motions while also calling her out on her ego and she doesn't even shy away from it. But I like how when this comes around to Satana telling Blade her decision on whether she's gonna help him or not, there's a moment here where she tells him that he didn't even go to Strange and he came to her cause he's running out of friends. So Blade tells her, I'm not your friend. So in response, Satana tells him, beg on your knees and I'll consider it. And Blade doesn't even budge. And to be honest, I'm surprised he didn't cuss her out right here. But after this brief pause, she lets him know that she's kidding. To where from there, she goes on to explain the details of what needs to be done. And to start this out, first she tells Blade, hell is seductive in ways people don't understand. The fire and pain, it's there, but God-fearing people miss the point. Hell is permission, the kind of freedom that Earth could never provide. Well worth the pain. And she goes on to let him know that she can get him there with a little bit of magic, but it's the getting him out part that's a little tricky. So to make this work, Blade's gonna need a tether, someone who's pure, someone on this side who he trusts, who also trusts him. So clearly for reasons expressed earlier, that person's not gonna be Satana. And she knows this cause she's aware that Blade doesn't trust anyone, but it also has her asking Blade the question, who actually trusts you? Which from here now takes us back over to Japan with Tulip and Rotha, where much like what we saw before, Tulip is still recovering from their previous encounter with the Adana. So right now, Rotha is just keeping an eye on her until Blade gets back. But while they're here, Tulip tells Rotha that she doesn't have to babysit her. And Rotha responds like, Blade said I needed to protect you. Almost like it's in a way where she's saying, these are my instructions, I've got to do this. So Tulip just kind of calls her out on it by telling Rotha she notices there's some type of paternal energy she's picking up from Blade. And we know that Tulip has noticed this for some time now, but right here she feels the need to warn Rotha about trusting Blade. Because for Tulip, the way that she sees it, that's what got her in the position she's in now. Soul bound by the Adana, who punished Tulip in order to get under Blade's skin. So for Tulip, in a number of ways, she feels like she's learned her lesson from her past relationship with Blade and more recently fighting alongside of him. Because either way, you get too close, you get hurt. So now she's just trying to warn Rotha about what could happen to her because she sees Blade as a father figure. And granted, at first, Rotha doesn't even know what the word paternal means. And it's not that she's too young to understand, but it's more of a translation barrier. So Tulip explains it to her. But as soon as she does, Rotha denies it because she remembers her father. He was a good man and he died when she was a child. <laughs> but the thing is, Rotha, she is still a child. So Tulip points that out and she asks her if she doesn't think that Blade is a good man. And Rotha tells her, good men have peaceful lives. I believe Blade seeks to be good. That makes his life more difficult. 
which in of itself, that statement is very true about Blade. And even further beyond the traditional sense of a noble man trying to do the right thing, because we saw earlier how he uses his anger to avoid being mind controlled. And it just goes to show when Blade doesn't use his anger, when he doesn't use the evil, so to speak, he's not tapping into his full potential. So for Blade, by not using the evil within and hating that part of himself, he's making things more difficult for himself than they could be. And this is precisely what Dracula was trying to get through to him while teaching Blade about his own true nature and how to unlock his full potential. Because to do this and reach the level of power that he needs to defeat the Adana, he needs to be the evil that he hates and embrace its power. He's got to use his anger. So when it comes down to the question of if Blade's a good man, the truth is he's still trying to figure that out himself. And I also think this goes back to what Dracula said about Blade's problem being perspective. Because until Blade truly understands what good and evil actually are, he won't understand himself and he'll never defeat the Adana. But in the middle of Tulip and Rotha's conversation, Blade barges in and he's like, the front door was open. Rotha, I need to speak with you outside, just you. And you can just tell by the look on their faces, like it's really giving dad vibes. Cause Rotha's just over there looking like, what I do? But the reason why Blade wants to speak with Rotha alone is so that he can ask her if she wants to be his tether. And there's no tricks here about it, he's straightforward with her, so she knows what she's getting into. So Rotha, kind of thinking out loud, she's like, it's a difficult question, but it's a matter of many innocent lives. And Blade tells her it's a matter of all innocent lives, <laughs> all of them. So she just says to herself, like under her breath, perhaps a bit paternal, just before telling Blade, yes, I will help you go to hell. Because now Rotha's beginning to see and admit to herself that she does see Blade as a father figure. So from here, they make their way over to Satana to perform the ritual. And she goes on to first tell Blade, since he's not actually dead, Hell doesn't want him there. So she needs to cloak him in death and it's gonna hurt. And as far as Rotha, no matter what she hears Blade do, she can't interfere. She must only focus on her compassion for him. And that's it. So Satana goes on with the spell. And for a moment, Rotha starts to respond like it's a conversation. And Satana more or less tells her to shut up. But it ends up working and painfully sending Blade to hell, where initially he finds himself at the Circle of Desolation. Which as far as I'm aware, this is something totally new. But we're quickly shown that it's this huge wall that's full of souls who are trapped in a perpetual state of desolation. And when Blade touches one of these guys, he can feel their pain and emptiness which on one hand is helping Blade do what he went there to do. But back in the world of the living, all Rotha sees is him suffering. So she wipes the tears from his eyes and Satana reminds her that she needs to remain focused so this whole thing will work. But as far as this circle of desolation and the souls who were placed here, this was done by a brat, the collector, who then shows up shortly after Blade's arrival. And right away, he knows that Blade's not supposed to be here because he's not dead, which in itself just goes back to the idea of balance. So to correct that, a brat would just kill Blade and problem solved. But Blade goes on to explain that he's here because of disruption of balance, which has caused him to come seeking an army of the damned to correct an imbalance in the land of the living. And right away, Abrath knows that Blade is talking about the Adana. And at first, he's kind of like, why should hell care about her? So Blade tells him if the Adana has her way, then she is going to replace this hell with her own. But with hearing this to Collector, he thinks Blade's just trying to scare him. So he's just like, you know what? I don't have to hear this. And he just goes on to add Blade to the circle of desolation, cause he's not buying any of it. But out of nowhere, Blade finds himself being freed by a very familiar face, with this being the assassin that Blade killed back in issue one, who was trying to stop the Adana in the first place. And this guy's able to chase off the collector so him and Blade can have a moment to talk. And when he does, he tells Blade that his name is Draven. He's the guy who Blade killed and damned the whole world in doing so. So Blade's just like, sorry about that. You look like a bad guy. But next, Draven asks Blade if he's seen his daughter in the living world. She's of his sect and her name is Rotha. And right here, Blade says exactly what I'm thinking, because he's like, daughter. Like how cults call everyone brother. And Draven says, no, Rotha is my child. And right there, it's just like, okay, we were intentionally misled from the beginning. So Blade goes on to assure Draven that his daughter is safe. But then Blade realizes that they can understand each other. So he's like, wait a minute. Why is it that I can understand you now and I couldn't before? So Draven tells him it's because I'm speaking English. And right there, it's like, all right, you talking slick now, but had you been speaking English in issue one, you wouldn't be here in hell. 
But this also begs the question of, if Draven's a good guy, then why is he in hell? And he explains the reasoning behind it, because when he died, he wasn't sent here, but rather he willed himself here, so he could get answers on how to stop the Adana. But long story short, Blade ends up asking Draven, if he brings him back to the living world, can he still destroy the Adana? And Draven's just like, with her growing power, I'm not sure. And so Blade's like, you know what, let me rephrase that. If I bring you back, can we do this together? And Draven tells him it's possible, but the catch is he'll only be a spirit. And this time, Blade has to listen to him. So Blade agrees, but he tells him, this time, you gotta speak English. And just like that, the two of them head back, which also reunites Rotha with her father. And I mean, as a ghost, but nonetheless, he's back. Which is cool to see, but I was kinda looking forward to Blade getting an army from hell. But hey, who knows where this could go next. Alright, so coming back, we find ourselves at a nightclub with Tanaka, who some of you guys might remember from back in issue 1, with him being the guy who set up Blade with false information that eventually led to Blade freeing the Adana. So fast forward to now with all hell breaking loose, with a number of people around the world having all sorts of dormant evils unlocked within them, Tanaka comes across this girl at the club who's just like, she's scared. And how for the longest time she didn't think demons were real, but now with them popping up everywhere, she finds it terrifying. So with Tanaka being a werewolf with no game, otherwise known as a simp walker, he just tells this girl, I'll protect you from them. And as soon as he does, a voice comes up from behind him saying, is that a fact, Tanaka? And before you know it, this guy's gone out the window. And I just imagine the young ladies watching this like, how can that man protect me? Look at him. So on his way down, Tanaka changes into his wolf form so that he can just land on his paws and make a break for it. But as soon as he touches down, all he sees is bright headlights behind him. Just before he's smacked with a car driven by Rotha, followed by a green mist approaching him, that forms into Blade. And Blade just lets him know, I told you what would happen if you played games with me. And really, back when we covered issue one, we knew this was coming. Because even before everything went left, Blade told Tanaka if he's lying, it's gonna be a problem. So of course, when we saw this whole thing was a setup, I was like, yeah, Blade not gonna let this slide. He's coming back for this man at some point. So from here, they end up taking Tanaka to a secluded area to get him to spill everything he knows about the Adana. But at first, Tanaka just doesn't want to cooperate. And he even tells Blade, like, what are you going to do? Waterboard me? Like, he's not taking this serious. So Blade lets Draven take things from here. And Draven has no intention of going easy on this guy. Because for one, we're talking about the fate of the world here. But number two, secondly, it was Tanaka's lies that got them all in this mess to begin with because Draven had long since been prepared to kill the Adana. But after he was killed by Blade, who was led by Tanaka's lies, this cost him his life, and it blew the opportunity for her to be stopped earlier when she was in a weaker state. So fast forward to now, Draven's not taking any chances. And instead of threatening or beating the truth out of Tanaka, Draven just rips through Tanaka's mind, violently taking the truth from him by way of a painful process that leaves no secrets behind. Which for a moment, this kind of has Tulip like, okay, like this might be a little over the top. You know, show him some mercy. But Draven just keeps going until he gets everything that he needs. And I gotta say, I don't blame the guy. And when Draven's done, he tells Blade that he knows how to hunt the Adana. Though Tanaka, on the other hand, his mind is a mess. So Draven leaves for a moment while telling the others that he's got to save his strength for what's to come. While right here, Tanaka begs Blade to just end it for him. Because whether he loses his mind or not, it's a wrap for this guy as soon as anyone finds out about the information that he's given up because the secrets he knew involve a number of others from the second world who have kept this information tight-lipped for centuries. And that's why he's just begging Blade to end them now. So Tulip covers Rotha's eyes as Blade does the deed. And just after, he tells both Tulip and Rotha to get some rest because they still got a demon queen to kill. And following this, we see Blade go to have a conversation with Draven, where again, Blade lets him know that he feels bad about killing him, you know, this whole thing being a misunderstanding. And Draven does tell Blade that he forgives him. And it comes off for Draven like it's easier to accept the defeat and forgive Blade than it is to think about what he's missing in the land of the living. But eventually in this conversation, Blade is like, okay, the Adana, how do I find her? So from here, Draven explains to Blade how her presence works after learning the truth from Tanaka's mind. So he tells Blade she is everywhere. She's in the heart of every man and woman who chooses evil. She embodies that, created by the universe to be living atrophy. She's in your rage, the satisfaction you feel when you cause violence. She believes she is the nature of all things. In many ways, she's not wrong. So in response, Blade tells Draven, 
Like, you know, I meant literally. Like, where can I find her? You know, so I can kill her? I uh, appreciate the poetics, though. So Draven tells him, I was a fisherman. And right there, Blades is like, okay, so you're dedicated to being hard to talk to, huh? Because <laughs> Blade just wants to know a location. But Draven assures Blade that if he follows his words, this will lead him to where he wants to go. And I'll admit, with the way that Draven is about to explain this, this is one of the rare moments where I feel like the long-winded answer is actually the best way to convey this message. Because Draven goes on to say, I was a fisherman. Fish feel the water move, and they avoid the boat. They disappear into the sea, and the hook goes hungry. Because fish don't want to be caught. So you need to give them something they do want. Something that will make them ignore the boat. Which then has Blade asking, so how do I put a worm on a hook? And Draven tells him, the Adana is a creature of arrogance. The weakness of arrogance is pride. Wound her pride, and she will come for the boat. But be certain you can manage the hook. Which right there is enough to put a smile on Blade's face. Because now, he's got a plan. So next, Blade makes his way back to Satana, who at first, she can't believe that Blade's asking for what he's asking for. Because after coming here, he's told her that he needs a way to make everything evil in the world want to kill him. Because in theory, if Blade draws enough attention, he can provoke the Adana to come for him. And when she does, he can use that same arrogance that lured her out against her. And though Satana's a bit hesitant at first, she eventually tells Blade that this might work. But at the same time, it could also blow up in his face. Because if Blade succeeds at getting all that is dark to come after him, there's a chance that they could be too much for him to handle. And to take it a step further, even if he can handle them, who's to say that he can actually defeat the Adana when she shows up? So Blade just tells her that he's more of a cross that bridge when I get to it kind of person. So nonetheless, she agrees, and she goes on to give Blade the details on where he can do the most damage, which after this sends Blade to a sacred location that's only supposed to be known by full blood creatures of the second world, which is a place called the Archives of the Second World. It's packed with ancient books and all sorts of dark secrets. So of course, with Blade knowing about this place, let alone being here, he's already offending the darkest forces in the world. But that's exactly what he wants, because destroying this place and slaughtering everyone here, this is just step one. But for a moment here, one of these guys who's still alive, he tells Blade, now that he's defiled this sacred place, he's gonna be the scourge of the darkest forces in the world. <laughs> so Blade's like, are you sure? Because I need you to be sure. Because again, that's exactly what Blade's going for here. And Blade even goes as far as to ask this guy, what happens if I kill you and burn this place down? <laughs> like, what'll that do for me? And this guy just pauses for a moment like, man, you can't be serious. And then the next thing we see is this smirk on Blade's face just before he takes this dude's head off and blows this place up, which then causes news to travel rather quickly about what Blade's doing. Because next we see Doctor Strange make his way over to Satana to tell her that he assumes it was her who told Blade the location of the archives of the second world. And she's just more or less like, well, yeah, you know, he asked nicely. And it just has Strange wondering why would she help Blade get the attention of the Adana? So she tells Strange there's really no heroic motivations behind it. She just wants to see what happens. And besides, there was nothing but a bunch of old books in there that nobody read. So Strange tells her like, hey, you know Blade cannot beat the Adana, right? So again, she just goes back to the whole idea of wanting to see how this plays out because Blade asked for help, not Faith. And she even goes on to say like, hey, you never know, Blade just might join the Adana, which right there just merits a crazy side eye from Doctor Strange. But from here, right away, we're shown that Blade's plan is working because a number of creatures and beings from the second world They've made their way to the Adana, looking for her to give some type of response to everything that Blade's doing. And because the Adana's seen her people coming to her in fear, with Blade inviting war on himself against all darkness, only to have the Adana do nothing, she takes this as a huge sign of disrespect. So she flames this person. Because for the Adana, a lot of this, it is pride. But also for her, back in issue 5, when she unlocked the dormant occult powers in a number of people across the world. This was her showing them who she is and how she was going to make evil and darkness as prominent as the light. So now, after showing this to her people, only to have them turn around and be like, well, what about Blade? To the Adana, this is like the highest form of disrespect because even after she's shown them her truth and her promise, they're still afraid. So the Adana, she just burns this one. And she's like, you can keep burning until your screams satisfy me. But she goes on to tell the others to spread the word because she will honor their needless traditions by going forward to destroy the Daywalker, which from here just leaves us the finale where Blade will face the mother of evil 
one last time. All right, so coming back, we pick up with Blade, who has recently put his team together to take down the Adana. And like we've seen, this team consists of members like Tulip, who's Blade's ex slash off and on love interest. Then aside from her, there's Rotha, the young skilled archer, who looks to Blade as like a father figure. You know, after Blade killed her actual father, Draven, who eventually Blade brought back from hell so that he could assist them in stopping the Adana which is what Draven trained his whole life for, which is really messed up when you think about it. Cause imagine training your whole life to stop the Adana. You find her, you are getting ready to do it, Blade's there, but Blade wasn't in the training. And it's like, man, he put all his eggs in one basket and it cost him his life. But nonetheless, he agreed to help Blade and he even went as far as to come up with the idea of how to bring the Adana out, which essentially is by provoking her until she shows up. So to bring her out, Blade and the others have had to kill a lot of her followers in hopes of getting her attention. And that's what we find them doing here at this point in Athens. But also, as a result of Blade burning down the archives of the second world, which not only was a sacred location that had been holding rare artifacts and books for centuries, which are all gone now, but to the vampires and the creatures of the second world, those who knew of the archives, they saw it like it was a holy ground, which held much of their history only to have Blade come through and destroy it completely. So of course, as a result, a ton of creatures from the second world are coming after him for payback. And this is precisely what they want, because it falls in line with Draven's plan to have Blade fishing for the Adana by provoking the creatures of the second world as a way to get her to focus on the bait, which is Blade, to the point where she'll completely forget about the hook. But right here with more of their enemies incoming, for a moment here we're shown one of the main things about Blade recently that has really got the Adana's attention, with that being his new power set that Blade unlocked after training with Dracula. So with him knowing this, for a moment he shows off for the Adana by turning into mist, only to get swallowed up just so he can make a bunch of these vampires explode from the inside out. In this whole time, I can't help but to hear the voice, the TD Jakes over all of this. Like, have you ever been swallowed? Like over it the whole time. Cause in a weird way, it kind of fits the whole Dracula vampire thing. But either way, you guys let me know in the comments. Not if you've ever been, but I mean like if you think the Dracula, you know what, Never mind. Let's get back to the story. But right here with Blade using his new abilities, which like we saw to tap into his full potential, this calls for him to lean into his darker nature. So for a moment here, we see that get the best of him. And for us, it just goes to show that this whole bait analogy, it could go either way. Cause for the Adana, this is the blade that she wants, whether that be for her entertainment or as her ally. And like we saw, this even has some people wondering if Blade is gonna completely go to the dark side and join her, where in that case, that would be the Adana catching the bait without being caught in the hook. Or there's the possibility that she just might kill him. You know, it's anybody's call at this point. So again, it's one of those things where it could really go either way. And it makes for the case where on one hand, you have allies like Tulip and Rotha, who are genuinely just concerned for Blade and his well-being. While on the other hand, you have those who are like Draven, where he's more or less like, I don't know, big dog. You might have too much dip on your chip, because if Blade actually loses the part of him that's good, there's no telling where things will go from there. But the next thing we see here is Satana show up, because for her, after telling Blade where he could find the archives of the second world, on one hand, she didn't actually think Blade was going to burn it to the ground. But at the same time, she's worked with Blade before, so she knows he's not the type to go in there and just kind of halfway it. But coming here, she lets them know that Draven's plan's working because the Adana is watching through the veil of time and space and her ego's provoked. So for a moment here, this just has Blade like, I don't care how she's watching. But Satana manages to convince him that he should care because the Adana's watching him through the veil of time and space. And because every link in magic works both ways, Satana now knows where the Adana is. So for a moment here, Satana's more or less like, yeah, you're welcome. Because recently the Adana made her way to Earth and now Blade can just walk through this portal and go straight to her. But before he does, he ends up telling Tulip and Rotha to stay here while him and Draven handle this. But of course, neither of them are trying to hear that. Because for Tulip, she wants payback after having a demon put in her and Rotha will follow Blade anywhere. But as they make their way through this portal to get to the Adana, Satana tells Blade and the others something very significant pertaining to the Adana, which falls in line with what we were first shown when the Adana revealed herself. Because Satana tells Blade that the Adana didn't come to remain. Her existence means nothing to her. She is in effect. And if you look at the world, she's already won. 
So of course with Blade hearing this, he's just like, all right, whatever. But as we head over to the Adana, we're shown in her words how this statement is very true. Cause she says herself, most of existence is darkness. Life is but a moment. Death is eternal. The true essence of existence is savagery. Civilization is the great lie. Fear is the first emotion every life feels. The seal is broken now. The darkness has come to calm this age. No matter what you do, that will not change. But we quickly find out that this monologue she's giving, she's telling all this to Blade. Cause she wants to make it clear to Blade before they get started. One, as she's described, darkness is already won. Which of course has Blade like, maybe, but we're still gonna destroy it. Only for that to lead to the Adana's second point, which is that she's already destroyed him. And it flips the perspective of what's actually happening here on its head in a number of ways. Cause at first she tells Blade in a more practical sense what she means. Since he now has Dracula's blood flowing in his veins, he killed Rotha's father, he brought Tulip along, only for her to get possessed, which has messed her up to the point where she can't sleep in the dark anymore. And then finally, he has the stink of hell on him after heading there out of desperation in search of an army. But her main point here is that there's no part of Blade that's left that hasn't been touched by her. And without her saying it directly, it now begs the question of if the Adana's already won and darkness has already prevailed, then what is her true intention or what is her true goal? Cause now as it would seem, she wanted darkness to abound in Blade or at least start him on that path while also being a catalyst to the utter destruction of good with her awakening supernatural abilities that were dormant in people all around the world. But the truth is, if that's what she came here to do, then her job is done. And it really seems that way cause going into this fight, she talks and she moves like she's just going through the motions. Cause right after she delivers the line telling Blade how no part of him is untouched by her, Blade tells her that she hasn't touched his sword yet. And it then just has her like, yeah, the only sword that can destroy me is the one that I brought. And oh, by the way, do you hear that music? I guess this is the part where you and me dance. And once again, it just feels like the Adana is two steps ahead of Blade. Cause recently heading into this fight, the focus has been on Blade and Draven's plan to take down the Adana. And in a lot of ways, it just overshadows the fact that from the beginning, we have never seen Blade get the upper hand on her. In every attempt that he's made to take her on, it has either not worked or it's just played into a part of her larger plan. So I say all that to say, I find it hard to believe that the Adana would just go from being this super smart and calculated villain slash god and just throw all of that away cause she's suddenly impatient. I just don't see it. And it's not even like you can say she's being corrupted by the Lightbringer because she's had it for so long while still demonstrating self-control. But nonetheless, with her taking on Blade and the others, Blade is very much leaning into Draven's plan along with the help of Tulip and Rotha cause even with it being obvious, that none of their weapons can kill the Adana, they still go all out to assure that her focus is on them. So naturally this dance, as she would call it, it quickly turns into a blade showcase with him pulling out all the stops as far as his new abilities. Cause for a moment here, he turns into mist to avoid getting cut by the Adana only to then appear behind her as a wolf, which right there, she just reverses to toss him off the cliff. But as soon as blade goes over, he just turns into a bunch of bats and comes right back. And it's pretty cold seeing him use these moves and form different combos and chains of attacks because over time it's almost like it's become more natural to him, which in his case is kind of the dangerous part with him risking the possibility of darkness taking over. But he keeps the chain going because for a moment here the Adana's like enough of the tricks. So she hits his bats with the burst attack. So Blade just turns back into mist and pulls himself together on the other side. But when he does, he lets the Adana know that she's misplaced the Lightbringer sword. And as soon as he says this, Draven drives it right through her back. Which as mentioned before, this does destroy her physical form, returning her to a state where she's less effective. But before she fades away, she makes sure to tell Blade that he's done nothing. Which of course doesn't seem to be the case cause she's clearly in a state of discomfort. And even after this is done, Tulip goes the extra mile by emptying a clip on the Adana, which you can tell is totally personal at this point cause it's over. But as things continue to settle, next Draven leaves now that his purpose has been fulfilled. But going forward, they also know what the Adana has set in motion, it's still happening. So for a moment here, Tulip, she brings it up to Blade and she asks him, what is he gonna do? So he more or less tells her that he's gonna take it one step at a time. He's gonna find things, fight things, and eventually unring the bell. And he welcomes both Tulip and Rotha to join him in that process. But for now, he's just gonna sit down and do nothing cause today they've done enough. Which from here concludes this volume and later this year, 2024, we have another Blade series coming. But before that kicks off, for the summer, we'll be getting a Blood Hunt event written by Jed McKay 
as well as Brian Hill returning for Midnight Sun's Blood Hunt. So yeah, this volume here was just the beginning of what could possibly be a new era for Blade. And so now real quick, I wanna give a special shout out to all the patrons. Thank you guys for all your support. And for anyone who's new here, who wants more information on how to support the channel, I got a link below where you can go to patreon.com slash dopespill. But that'll do it for this one, guys. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments below, and we'll do it again on the next one. All right, later.